Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the um, age of space and cyber warfare. And I'll tell you that the number one greatest threat that we face is the lack of imagination to understand that these are very real and credible threats. When I say welcome to the age of space and cyber warfare, I have to point out that we've ignored it, overlooked it, or pretended it didn't happen, or didn't attribute it correctly. But there is a proud 30 or 40 year tradition of space and cyber warfare in this world. It's been engaged by not just superpowers or lesser powers, or, but third world nation powers very effectively. Now when I say engagements, and when I'm talking about warfare, I'm talking about the use of engagement for political purpose. There are people out there that have a vested interest in making sure that the sensors that are on those satellites or the information that they route don't get to their receivers. There's also a similar vested interest in making sure information from the internet doesn't get to where it, it belongs. Now, we're much more familiar with cyber because it's so prolific and we interact with it every day in our own personal lives at every opportunity that we can get. If any of you are addicted to your iPhone or, or Crackberry, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. But wow, what we call cyber warfare today evolved out of space warfare. Space warfare a satellite is nothing more than a computer put into space where everybody on the Earth has a fabulous vantage point and view of it. Of course, that's one of the attributes of a space system. It's got such a fabulous view of the Earth. But it works both ways. A satellite is a computer that has a sensor, and it routes information. It's incredibly vulnerable. Incredibly vulnerable. Now, there are a, a lot of people out there that make a lot of noise about direct ascent or even co-orbital ASATs that will impact and blow up satellites on orbit. And we've seen these things tested, or we've seen heard claims that what was tested was actually an anti-satellite weapon. Uh, it's far more likely that that type of technology was used for missile defense related technologies rather than a direct anti-satellite weapon. Here's why I say this. A sailor knows enough not to mine his own harbors. And a soldier knows enough not to put mine f minefield in his own camp. Well, a space professional knows enough not to blow up every bit of matter in outer space or to take out a satellite because you have to live with that debris like its own minefield for, well, it could be generations. And when I say generations, I'm speaking about a satellite's generation, which is roughly equivalent to a dog's life, seven years. Uh, so it, the dog life standard of a generation for space is something that uh, we all need to take into account. Now, when I talk about space warfare, the examples I give are always unclassified and easy for each of us to research on the internet. We have to be widely aware that uh, Iran is one of the most prolific counter space powers out there, routinely jamming not only European news going into the Middle East, but also jamming US UAV traffic, you know, the satellites that are carrying the command and control lines for UAVs going into the Middle East. In fact, they're so clever about this, a few years back they sent two of their people uh, to Cuba and were jamming out the window of a hotel room with their equipment. It took us a great deal of time to figure out who it was that was doing that and I have to also compliment the Cuban government. They were very responsive to make sure that they did not get uh, accused of, of this act. But you know, the Iranians had been asked, why are you jamming the, the broadcast coming into the Middle East? And the response they gave over in Geneva a few years back was really kind of telling. And I think we need to pay a little bit of attention to that, that, that what, they, what they argued. It's better than blowing up ground stations in Europe. And without even being aware of it, they had just invoked the law of armed conflict. The law of armed conflict requires me as a military member to take any non-lethal and non-destructive means of achieving my objectives whenever doing so can be clearly demonstrated so that I can, uh, the criteria that we're given, reduce human loss of life and suffering and loss of property. And so you see engagements against satellites is a very palatable type of option. Plus, if I develop an anti-satellite weapon that goes into space on the end of a rocket and blows up, I've got, two pro I've got a few problems with that. First, it's going to cost me millions of dollars to develop that rocket and to employ it on each and every occasion. It's going to cost me billions of dollars, probably in equivalent funds from around the world, to develop an impact type of device that would impact a satellite. Next, 
just the simple act of engagement is something that is not going to go undetected. And typically, you're not going to go to a third-party country to do this type of launch. So it's immediately attributable. This is the problem that we have with not only space, but cyber. Number one, what is the probability of detection? Do I even know that I've been attacked? Oftentimes, we don't. Sometimes the technique, a cyber technique, is something that was buried in a code of data stream through sabotage that you won't even know about it until the designated time comes. Probability of detection is difficult. Second, the probability of attribution. Who do I, who do I think did this? Now, there's some times where you're almost at a loggerhead and a war with a different country, and it's almost obvious at least who's, who's acting on somebody's behalf. However, in the cyber world, we've seen, for example, in the case of the Russians, back during their execution against Chechnya, they merely uh, let it be known that all the hacktivists in their country, hey, you're free to have at the, 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 the Chechen Republic, or Georgia, excuse me, I'm using the example of Georgia. And of course, what we saw was the takedown of the Georgian internet and the capture of their data systems. And so it doesn't even need to be a nation state we are living in the age of the super-empowered individual, where the lone individual has at his fingertips and with small collectives of other people nation-like capabilities that only nations had about 10 years ago. You know, we've heard about Stuxnet, we've heard about Iron Storm, we've heard about all these different types of attack methodologies that are out there, but as the former director pointed out, there's a 17-year-old out there right now who's every bit as capable today given the ideas that hit the internet and spread like wildfire that can configure a type of attack that we are not even imaginatively prepared to deal with. 9-11 was made possible by the lack of imagination that anybody would use aircraft in that manner. A lock on a door, securing the cabins of a cockpit, a few rules and procedures, and this type of attack would never have happened. And the, and the price of converting those aircraft to save them, again, as the director points out, oftentimes is not that expensive. Oftentimes, in space and in cyber, it's a matter of just changing up the way you do business on some unpredictable pattern that changes the predictability that an adversary needs to engage against you. As we shift our attention from a Western perspective to a more Eastern mindset, we need to understand that in Asia, as Sun Tzu wrote 26 centuries ago, all warfare is based on deception. That which you use the most and rely on the most you must appear to use the least and rely on the least. And the reverse is true. What is inconsequential to you must be broadcast as the most important thing that you have and your greatest vulnerability, so an adversary wastes their intelligence and their time gathering against that. There is a reason why the Russian word for counterintelligence is konspirovsko. It's interesting. Hide inside the, create conspiracies and hide inside it so that you can't be attributed Probability of attribution is going to remain a single large problem. The director of the NSA, former director, uh, made a comment at Air University a couple weeks ago that the lack of attribution for activities that people are taking in the internet, on the internet, is his principal, was his principal problem in knowing that you have a problem and the ability to identify who did it enables you to pick your appropriate kind of response. Here's the problem. If you don't know, you, if, you if you can't, detect you have a problem, and you can't attribute who did it, how do you develop deterrence against these kinds of threats? Now, in the past, we used the policy of deterrence as our defense. But this is very arcane to the Chinese, and, and, and there's a lot of writing about this that you can find. Deterrence is not something that's a bluff. Deterrence is real, credible, almost proactive engagement to shape the environment through the use of coercion. Interesting. So our Cold War mindset that Thomas Schelling wrote about so convincingly back in the 1950s about the, the, the ability to deter through shows of strength and force and commitment and resolve, this type of idea may not actually be what is in play against major nation states as we do the pivot from the west towards the east. We need to be prepared for that. That will be a cultural mind shift. But the worst case of all is those super empowered individuals. This is on the mind of the NSA as they developed their current schema under FISA of what they observe, how they observe it, and how they process the information that flows regularly across the Internet. And while the Snowden disclosure shocked many, the United States is not the only nation that's in that game. 
and I would not even score us as first or second in that game in terms of collection of content and processing and utilization of it. There's a lot that's going on <clears throat> in this cyber world that we have yet to get our arms around, and it's going to change. There are types of cyber technologies coming down the pipe that are being delivered by the gaming community into the hands of children that you will not, it, it, it will strike your sensitivities. There's a project that was designed to, to create better prosthetics, mechanical prosthetics for veterans. And the study procedure utilized a bicycle helmet that was hollowed out with a series of electroencephalogram monitors on it, placed on the head of an individual to, to pattern the brain waves as they interact with physical stimuli, etc. But what they also determined is they can run this helmet information into a computer and then they can show you a movie and then they can observe your brain doing the learning in relationship to this movie. And then after they show you this four hour movie where they take breaks, they can turn the movie off and then they can start asking you questions and they're already catching the fragments of thoughts with the ability to read some of it. It's just snippets. And for some reason, humans think about hippopotamuses every 30 seconds. <laughs> and so there's a, lot, there's a lot that's involved with this type of information gathering. Match this to the type of technology that's going on to create handless devices. They're working on projects of Wi-Fi that don't necessarily go machine to machine where you have that machine in your hand. They're talking about doing this Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi using the human neuro frequencies so that you can simply sit there and interact with a visual device simply by thinking about it. We haven't been able to break through the barrier where we can insert stimulation into your brain where you experience visual and auditory. Well, some people claim they have, but they usually get locked up. But uh, <laughs> what we really need to be cognizant of, the, the cyber community is going to change. I anticipate that the sixth form of warfare to add to air, land, sea, space, and cyber is actually going to be what would we call it? Psychic warfare? Mental warfare? Where we may have the opportunity of injecting what we want you to think into your brain or extracting the information we want to get from you without you even knowing that your nervous system is being accessed? Now we're years off from this. In our lives, we interact with the media and we know that we can turn the channel. Imagine if you can't. Imagine if you don't get to select the information that you're accessing. Michio Kaku, the great <coughs> futurist and physicist who's done a great deal to popularize uh, string theory. He's one of the founders of string theory. He talks about, you know, back during the war, there was a Frenchman who, he was kind of a futurist, and he loved study, he studied like the expos and things like that. But he anticipated quite pr presciently, you know, going to the moon, and he anticipated the Americans, the greatest tinkerers in the world at that time, with all the mass that he could see growing that the United States was able to bring to bear on problems. The United States would probably be the first nation to go to the moon. And he said, you know, rockets, the things that the Chinese have, and that, that so long ago, and now that, the, you know, they've been developed to this point, it would probably be by a chemical rocket but weight is a big problem, but I've talked to people and said so they'll probably stage these things. And you wouldn't send one person, probably not even two, you'd probably send three. And if America does it, they'll probably do it from that great, great landmass Florida, because they can go either east or west off of it and bring them back and splash into the ocean. The war I'm talking about is the American Civil War, and it was 1865 when Jules Verne penned this, a visitor to Paris in the 20th century. There is a very real future science community out here. I represented them for a number of years with the Air Force when I was the head of DreamWorks back at the Pentagon and then at the Center for Strategy and Technology at Maxwell. The future exists today. And when you go to a science and technology conference, it's interesting what they present. But you want to get that person off on the side who has all this brilliance and this genius and you ask him, what's your pet project that you're really working on in your garage? And that's how Jules Verne was able to predict 100 years later that it'd be America that would go to the moon. So with this, I ask you to keep your imagination open. I know I've thrown out a very compelling thought there at the end about how cyber could evolve even further. But I'm still very optimistic about the future. And it's with engagements and discussions like this that we will learn and that we will be able to inform and advise the type of people to make better policy decisions in the future.